continuing in Matthew 24. You should probably go back and uh, watch the others if you have not yet. There's an intro, which is a, a, a part one, and there's three or four other parts before we get to this one. I don't know. I'd have to pull it up and, and look. Um, like and subscribe here on this YouTube channel and uh, help spread the word. And also, if you subscribe, you'll be notified of when more um, parts to this come up. If you look down on the channel, you'll see playlists. And um, there are many playlist things that are eschatology related. There's a series through the Book of Revelation, and, and a lot of the same material is um, shared there. But in addition to that, um, there might be some things that are said or, or responses to questions that are asked in the Bible study group that will cover a topic or an angle that uh, that we don't we don't cover here necessarily. I, I don't necessarily remember to do a full barrage of absolutely everything that there is to be known about um, a topic, a subject. Um, when I do one of these, um, I try to get what I think are the salient points, and uh, invariably something gets lost in the cracks and it's not necessarily helpful. So, um, picking up from last time, we kind of mentioned and got into um, this generation. I want to answer a part of that too that that invariably comes up, and it's a it's a good question. And I maintain, as I maintained in the former video, that this generation in in this context is about the things, all these things. Verse 34, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. So the context and the emphasis is on the things, not the generation. Um, but as happens, you have some people who will want to try to count out how long a generation is and try to figure out uh, you know, using that angle of mathematics and trying to figure out, you know, when the rapture is going to be or when the second coming is going to be or what have you. And I, I don't think that's the point. Um, it, this is going to be as we're getting ready to see as in the days of Noah. How long was the day, it was a generation in Noah's day? Granted, just about everybody lived to be at least eight or 900 years old um, back then, pre-flood, um, different atmosphere and so forth. Methuselah, um, until he... Until he died, the flood was not going to come. And somebody once quipped regarding Methuselah that uh, as soon as he died, the first rainbow started falling. And I don't think there's anything in Scripture about that. But it's, um, you know, it, it kind of makes the point. It makes the point. God, God's mercy and his grace through Methuselah and his patience and waiting for someone to turn. And they never did. And, and Noah, when God instructed Noah to get on the ark, after all the animals walked up onto the ark by themselves and all the neighbors could watch and see and go, this is really weird, dude, because Noah didn't go out and wrangle them up like they show sometimes in pictures and in cartoons and some movies. Uh, Noah's there watching, going, oh, what do we have here? And there's a parade of animals coming, and God kept bringing them onto the ark. So people had to be thinking, this is kind of weird, because why are these people coming over here to see Noah? This is kind of, he's a strange dude. We've, we've been watching him, you know, working his sons to build this big giant boat out here where there's no ocean up on top of this mountain. What is he thinking? Um, so anyway, uh, the door remained open for quite a while before God shut the door and brought the reins and, and nobody asked, nobody said, Hey, you got room for another family? No, not until after the door was shut and we'll, we'll go into that. So, but so the generation, how long is a generation? I'm not sure that it matters because a generation is uh, for however long it needs to be. There are places where you can find a pattern of, um, 40 years. You can say 80 years. I've seen 90 years. And some people will say 100 or 110. You know, let's just keep adding the numbers or play with the numbers until we find a date that we're, we like. And then we'll say, yeah, that's the one. So um, I don't think it works that way. Now, in, in the previous chapter, what we did see, let me scroll down here and click here on Matthew 23. We did see where a generation does refer to a specific group of people. And um, this generation here was uh, a generation of, of vipers. And the Lord says, you know, look at the scribes, you hypocrites, and he's castigating them for um, all their evil and for the burdens they put on people and so forth. And calling them blind guides and hypocrites. He calls them hypocrites over and over. Now you extort people and so forth. And he's calling them hypocrites again in this section. And every time you turn around here, he's calling them hypocrites and brood of vipers. Uh, and, you know, you, you kill the... You killed the prophets. And uh, so he he's just tearing them up. So 
he calls them a um, generation of vipers. And so that is a generation of something specific or, or you know, someone specific. This one here, the language is, is different. It says this generation um, will by no means pass away, verse 34, until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by, by no means pass away. So I, I think, and it's my opinion, that the generation um, that he's speaking of is the things. And here's another reason why I think, although the audience is Jewish primarily here, that he's not speaking to this generation, meaning you Jews who are alive right now. He's talking about the generation that sees these things. Um, I say to you, this generation that sees all this stuff will by no means pass away till all these, all these things take place from top to bottom. All the things we started off with. And what did he start off with? Um, let's go up here. So he leaves the temple. Um, he sits down on the Mount of Olives and they ask him this threefold question. Tell us. When will these things be? And that's what they wanted to know. They wanted to know the when and what will be the sign of your coming. So he gave them a bunch of signs of his coming and of the end of the age. So he's giving them a bunch of signs of the end of the age. And uh, so he launches into this and, and now he's right away. He's talking about Israel. He's talking about Judah. He's talking about um, who it's happening here too. And it's, it's, um, it is, uh, you know, the land of Judea and uh, Israel and so forth. So, we get down here, and he, he says, this generation will by no means pass away. Now look at this word. Till all these things take place. So if you say this is about Israel, then you're saying, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until. So you're saying the Jews will not pass away until what? All these things take place. So you mean once all these things take place, Israel passes away? The Jews pass away? Uh-oh. I don't think that's what it means. We have too many Old Testament passages that talk about God and, and he will um, keep his promises. We have New Testament passages too, but too many with the Old Testament passages about um, how God will, although they'll go through a time of, of trial and tribulation and so forth, that God will um, bring them through to the other side and into the promised land, the land of milk and honey. So there's no till all these things take place in Israel. Is going to be wiped out, right? So there's that to consider. Now, aside from looking at until all these things take place and how you better hope, as, as Paul pointed out in Romans 11, that you better hope that God doesn't change his mind about that promise to Israel because if he can change his mind on the promise to Israel, he can change his mind on the promise to you Gentiles as well, to the church. So does God keep his promises or not? But I want to point out some passages here. Um, Let's keep going in this because um, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. This is kind of where we left off this last time, except for this little note I wanted to add. Um, this is the other phrase that gets used and abused to death, and that is, um, no man knows the day or the hour. So what does that mean? And anytime we try to express that we want to watch for the Lord's coming, some believers are excited and want to be like the uh, like the bride, waiting for the bridegroom, standing at the window, watching, waiting, listening, hearing. We find that in the parable of the ten virgins, right? The bridesmaids are outside. It's part of the wedding tradition. They're outside watching. Jesus commanded, watch therefore. He gave a bunch of signs and then he said, watch therefore. Well, wait, why are you beating them up for watching if Jesus commanded, watch therefore? We're supposed to watch for these signs. No man knows the day or the hour. Okay, but we can know the season. No man knows the day or the hours. Shut up. It's ridiculous. But you can watch. And we should be excited watching. When I was a kid and I knew that, you know, Grandma and Grandpa are coming over or something, um, or my Uncle Bill, and I was excited and hadn't seen him for a while. Man, I'm every time I'm hearing a car go by, I'm running to the window, running to the door, and it's that, ah, oh, it doesn't sound like his car. And I'm like, oh, it's not him. And then, you know, I'm watching and I'm listening and I'm waiting. And uh, what kind of a what kind of a bride is not excited waiting for her bridegroom? Yeah, to be rethinking that marriage if it's like, eh, he gets here when he gets here. No man knows. What kind of attitude is that? Do you love him? Do you love Jesus Christ? You ought to be excited watching. I understand it can get exhausting and tired, tiring, and uh, you know that's why you don't want to be setting dates and and it's, I think it's this year. And I'm listening to all these people on YouTube and they're saying it's this year. Well, I hope so. And this is a high watch time of year type of a thing. But um, 
and, and we expect he's going to return some year, someday. Um, I don't think it's too far off because a lot of the things that are lining up in the world, like the nations um, piling in around um, Syria on the border of Israel that are the Gog and Magog nations that are all camped out right across the razor wire fences right now. Um, that has a half-life or you could say taking it out of a uh, radioactive type of <laughs> terms. It has a shelf life. That's something that people understand. Okay. There's an expiration date. It's kind of blurred. We don't know what it is. Don't know the day or the hour that's going to expire because it's blurred on there. But anyway, there's a, there's a shelf life on those events. Um, so things are going to cross over and you've got to have the Gog and the Gog confrontation of Ezekiel 38. Um, and uh, that, that's going to happen before too long. And I don't think Iran and Russia and Turkey and those nations that are over there right now um, stirring things up are going to go, you know what? Let's just go home and then take off for, you know, another generation or several years. It's just not. And so we, we know that there's a shelf life to some of these things that are happening in the world around us and the evil and the level of evil that just keeps increasing on a global scale. If we're, if we're honest, um, well, sorry, post mill people. Um, it's not getting better and better. And, and Peter and Timothy said it wouldn't get better and better and talked about how it's going to get worse and worse. So biblically, no. I know y'all sometimes want to say that that's a straw man argument, but it really isn't. You're the ones who are saying it. And it's going to get, uh, um, through the infusion of the influence of the church, salt and light, that it's going to have some level of improvement over time upon the earth, and then the Lord's going to come back. And that's the opposite of what the epistles tell us. But I digress. So, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Um, First of all, one of the things that uh, that people will say right off the bat here is, is look, Jesus doesn't even know. Because it says no one knows. Well, <laughs> there's this version. We can go up here and we can go, um, let's, let's pick another version. Let's pick New American Standard. Let's go there. Is there another version of it that says that even Jesus doesn't know? Um... Ah, but about that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels. <laughs> you don't know the Son, but the Father alone. So you can see that, because I know I've heard this somewhere in here before. Like, well, hey, why is it in the New King James? And they seem to search out because there's a couple of different texts that get used on some of these translations. So it's always good. This is why I like Bible Gateway and other um, Bible software, because you can jump over and check real quick. All right. Nor the Son, but the Father alone. Now, one way, not just context, and cross-referencing different translations, another way to understand things is if you get into know the culture and the people. This particular phrase, I've learned, has a, a two-fold meaning. One of the meanings is um, with a particular feast day. There are seven feast days given in Leviticus 23, and these are the Lord's feast days. No, these are not Jewish holidays. These are not the Jews' feast days. The Lord gave them to Israel in Leviticus 23 and said, these are my feast days, and you will keep them forever and ever. Um, not that we have to keep them as, as Gentiles and as the church, but um, God established these because um, they're about Jesus. They're not about Israel. They're not about Jews. Uh, and um, they are all types of Christ. And we know 1 Corinthians 15, for instance, we know how Jesus fulfilled Passover. He was the Passover lamb. His blood was shed so that death would pass over um, those who um, spread his, the blood over the doorposts, right? So, and Jesus is the Passover lamb, sacrificed, etc. Uh, we also know that unleavened bread, leaven is a, a symbolic in the Old Testament for sin. Jesus is unleavened bread in the sense that he, when he died, he, he died without sin. He had no sin. He lived the perfect life that we cannot live. And he died on the cross. Suffered, took the wrath of God so that we do not have to go through wrath. And that's key too. Um, first fruits, feast of first fruits, and these are the three spring feasts. First fruits, he's the first fruit among the dead, the first one resurrected. Um, was he the first one resurrected um, in even the time he was on the earth? No, he himself raised several, but first fruits had to do with the, the best of the best. And Jesus was the best of the best, and he remains the preeminent first fruits from among the dead of those resurrected, um, and he will for eternity. And then um, Pentecost, Feast of Weeks, we know what happened. Pentecost, um, and so, hey, it is kind of about church, right? Because church 
started on Pentecost. So those Jewish feast days have nothing to do with us. We're the church. We're the bride of Christ. Okay, explain Pentecost. Because the Pentecost is when we received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and all the spiritual gifts and so forth. And that's what in terminology as well, because that's like the engagement ring. Um, when he leaves, he says, I'm going to leave you a comforter. I'm going to leave you. And he's going to come alongside you. And he's going to... Um, so he left the Holy Spirit for us, and that's his promise ring for his bride till he comes back. So now we get into this long summer period where there's nothing, and then we have three fall feasts. And the very first one, Feast of Trumpets, also known as Yom Teruah, and secular world will call Rosh Hashanah. It's the head of the year. And there's a, 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 a civil reason for that. It's not New Year's Day on the Hebrew calendar. Um, that was back several several months ago, but it's, they still call this the head of the year, and there's reasons for that that I'm not going to get into. But anyway, it's in the secular world, on the civil calendar, they will off, often call it Rosh Hashanah, which Rosh means head. So Hashanah is of the year. So Rosh Hashanah is the head of the year. But really, it's Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets. It's what it's celebrating. And the Feast of Trumpets is known as, as the Feast that No Man Knows. The reason why it's the feast that no man knows the day or the hour is because um, of all the feast days that were commanded to be um, recognized and celebrated on the full moon. Except this one. This one is celebrated on the new moon, which is just a little sliver of a, of a moon. Now, in Western culture, a new moon is a big giant ring of black nothingness, a, a black hole in the sky. Oh, I think that's the moon right there because I don't see anything and there's no stars. Um, so maybe in the, in the desert, right? You have the right kind of lenses on your camera or something, but in the in the city with all the street lights and all that going on, no, not so much. But anyway, so uh, what they did on Feast of Trumpets, and most of you probably already know this, is they send two witnesses up on the highest point, and they're watching. Since it has to do with the uh, autumnal equinox and the crossing, the position of the sun and the moon relative to the equator, um, what happens that time of the year is is where the sun is coming down. The moon is coming up and makes a brief appearance and then goes back down. And it's a new moon, so they're looking for a little sliver of the moon when it gets up somewhere. And there's a very good chance that they won't see it on the first day when they've kind of calculated it should be today. They're not permitted to declare um, the um, beginning of the month and um, Yom Kippur, or Yom Teruah, sorry, until they see that sliver of a moon. So it's probably going to celebrate it the second day right um so it can go the celebration can go you know like three days so what happens is when they sight of the moon and and uh, it's over jerusalem and that's what we kind of look for because the lord says um there'll be a, at, at the sound of the trumpet first corinthians 15 and so forth we get this this trumpet type stuff so shall the coming of the Son of Man be and all of that. It has to do with the trumpet and the shout and things. And that's what they're doing with the shofar, the ram's horn, um, during Yom Teruah. It's, it's, a, it's a call to attention. And it's a call to attention. And there's, there's um, 10 days of repentance. And um, there's a lot of joy and praise and things like this. And then um, uh, 10 days later, you have Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And it's just a one-day celebration. But so Yom Teruah kicks off this 10-day ten, ten period of um, contemplation, repentance, and so forth. And then you've got Yom Kippur, and that's later. And then after that will be um, Feast of Tabernacles. That's where they set up the booths, the tents outside, um, in recognition of how God dwelt with them in the wilderness. So, And that's going to be symbolic of, of the kingdom, the setup of the kingdom. At the second coming of Jesus, he will come and dwell with us forever. So that's how those are kind of celebrated. So about the day and the hour no man knows, um, notice the disciples did not pipe in here and go, whoa, 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 wait a minute, what, is, what does that mean? Because it's a twofold meaning. One is it means that, but it's also got wedding symbology in it. In that, when the bride and the bridegroom are betrothed, there's a lot of Lord's Supper type things going on here with the contract and the drinking of the wine and, and the fathers are involved and so forth. And then, and then the um, the uh, Holy Spirit given as a, a gift 
as a promise to come back. And, and so this type of thing happens. And may, like I said, Western culture, ours is a little bit different. We'll have an engagement ring. There's some similarities in, with this culture, but not entirely. So then uh, what you have is um, the sun would go away and do a room addition. And unlike Western culture where, you know, you're saving up money for an apartment or to, a house to rent or what have you, it's it was different back then and in this culture. Um, especially in Galilee, what they would do is uh, they would the son would go to the father's house and they would do a room addition um, to the house or build right next to it or, or something like that on the on the father's property, and he'd be gone for approximately a year. So that's how the virgins or the bridesmaids would know. Oh, it's about that time. And uh, Jesus mentions about coming at midnight. Is that kind of Language goes on some, and, but that was a fun thing to do, especially a Galilean wedding. Everybody's asleep, going to sleep, and all of a sudden, neighbors wake up to a racket coming down the street, and they go, oh, what's going on? Somebody's getting married. And they go look out the windows, go stand on the front porch, and watch this processional go by. So that's how um, the day and the hour, the angels don't know, the son doesn't know, only the father knows. But the um, coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. Okay, let's, let's stop right there. So... Before we get on to the, to the Noah thing, let's finish the wedding. So the son will go away and he'll do this room addition. And the father has to approve of the additions and the changes. He's got more experience and so forth. So um, the father will come in and he might make some recommendations. And then when he thinks it's ready um, and the son is excited, he knows. But he's still got to wait for the father to say, go take your bride. So... At the time when the father does that, there's a lot of anticipation waiting, and the bridesmaids are waiting, and it might be midnight, who knows. So at some point, the father goes and shakes his son and says, hey, it's time. Go take your bride. And that's what he gets excited. He rounds up his um, wedding party, it consists of the best man and his other friends and male family members, and, and they're gathering up, uh, it might be drums or, or something to bang on, and uh, shofar, and they'll be going down the street in kind of a processional, a parade through town, and they're, they're headed on their way to um, the bride's home. And they're making all kinds of racket. So the, the um, bride, her party is kind of, they're kind of ready to know any day now. It's going to be any hour now. Don't know exactly when. We don't know the day or the hour. We're just, we're listening. We're watching. She's got her bags packed. She's ready to go. Her wedding dress, it's all white. It's, you know, Laid out, she's ready to grab that sucker, grab her bags, whatever, and take off when the time comes. So, well, this is interesting. So, when the son, when the bridegroom, I'm sorry, when the bridegroom gets to the bride's home, um, you know, usually there's an outside gate. Many of our homes are kind of like that. There's a gate. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, kind of like Elvis's mansion, right? <laughs> there's a gate. There's a gate, and he doesn't come all the way in. He doesn't come all the way in. He doesn't come knocking on the door. He doesn't come to her house. He's at the gate. Just as Jesus said, that he'd be coming in the clouds. So he comes in the clouds, and he says, and then I'll take you with me. But read John, the first handful of verses in, in um, John 14. Oh, let's just look. Let me just do this, okay? Since we're here, take a little extra time to do this, because this is really a controversial passage, and we need to just go ahead and visit it. Um, John 14. Okay. So, don't let your heart be troubled because, you know, he's been talking about, you know, I'm going to have to leave. I'm going to have to go. He's been telling him about the crucifixion and things. He's been telling him i got to die. And things. <laughs> they're not getting it. They're not. And I think the Holy Spirit's kind of blinded them for a season too. And they're kind of wondering what's going on here because I don't, you know. So, he says, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you because I'm going there to prepare a place for you. This is all wedding language. So they should have been going, hmm. Huh. And they probably were because they didn't really inquire about it and say, wait, 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 hold time out. What do you mean? They did this at other times. Um, and I go, and they'll do it and hear about something else. Okay. He says, um, I would have told you because I am going there to prepare a place for you. And listen to this. If I go to, Prepare a place for you. I'm coming again and will take you to myself. I will go and take you to myself. This is the taking, the rapture, being caught up together. Um, the 
with snatching away or catching away. This is the taking. This is it. This is the wedding tradition right here. This is the rapture. Um, so, so I'm going to go and take you to myself. Now, notice this is different from the second coming, right? Second coming is I'll come back and I'll live with you. No, this is I'm going to go prepare a place for you. I'm coming again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you will also be. Okay, he's going to be at the, at the Father's house. Um, he's talking about, at my Father's house are many rooms. Okay. Or is it, see, the language here isn't, um, when you die, you're going to come up here and visit me. It, it wasn't about death. About, you know, I'll be up here waiting. I'll leave the light on for you. I'm Tom Baudet. No. He's at the Father's house. He says, if I'm preparing a place for you, I'm going to come back and take you to myself. This is the rapture. Um, so that where I am, you also will be. And you know the you know the way where I'm going. And this is, see, this is what is typical of the disciples. They go, whoa, whoa, whoa. And this is Thomas. Thomas is only the one who's got the questions, right? He said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? Well, Jesus, for one thing, Jesus already said, I'm going to come and take you. You know, and if he's, if he's driving the bus, you don't need to worry about where you're going necessarily, right? Jesus said to him, I am the way. I am the way. I am the bus driver. I'm the ride. Um, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So you're, you're not going to just show up at the door. Jesus is going to come and get you and take you. You have to be invited to the wedding. Otherwise, you're that stranger at the wedding. It, concerning the end times, at least about four different times concerning kingdom, Jesus gave um, wedding imagery uh, in, in the form of parables. Um, this is uh, similar to that, where um, it references, cross references with some other um, passages and so forth in the Bible. So, um, anyway, so we go back to, let's go back here. I'm going to go back to the New King James Version because that's where I was before. Sorry, I'm not trying to create confusion. I'm trying to show you how you think these things through and you lose logic, you lose, lose, use context. I've got my tongue wrapped around my eye teeth and I can't see what I'm saying. So you use context and you use culture and you use, um, you know, history. You, use, you apply everything on uh, the text to um, get the sense of what the author wants to communicate. And he pulls uh, a paradigm over the scripture and overlay the scripture with the paradigm. I don't care whether you call it dispensationalism or whether you call it reform theology or whether you call it whatever. You want to say what's he trying to communicate here. And that's what you always want to do. So you'll cross-reference all kinds of other passages and not try to force them together. You want to stay in the context looking a little before and after to make sure that you're plugging them together properly and that you have synthesis where they have agreement in the passage and not contradiction. If there's you finding contradiction, then you're probably reading something wrong. Okay. So anyway, let's get down there. I know I'm really belaboring this, but this is this is important and it's really controversial. So since it's controversial, I'm trying to put everything in the right context. So um of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Um, like I said, that, that kind of has wedding tradition um, language to it that we can apply there and Yom Teruah. Now, I'm going to do something else here. Um, I, I'm going to, we're just going to shred these verses into just as fine a detail as possible, split them up here. So that day and hour, no one knows, not the angels of heaven, but my father only, because the father is the one who says, go take your bride. Okay, so that's the language. Um, I don't think I want to, I'm not quite done with the, there, because um, we want to know what it's about. Um, look at verse 44. In verse 44, he also says, therefore, you also be ready for the son of man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So not only do we not know it's an hour we do not expect. So the question comes, I have this question too. Um, how do we not know the hour? We, I know we don't now. As of this moment, we do not know the hour, the day and the hour of the second coming, right? So people will mock, all millennials love to do this, mock you, pre-tribulation, pre-wrath. People are 
premillennialists and all of you, you have your secret rapture. Ha, ha, ha. Well, do you know when the second coming is? Ha, ha, ha. You all millennialists, you have a secret second coming. You don't know when the second coming is either, do you? And they'll both be just a secret. Because I guarantee you, once the rapture happens, it won't be a secret. Was the flood a secret? Was Noah's ark being lifted up and floating away with the door shut? Was that a secret? So it might be a secret now. We don't know now. But it's not always going to be that way. Any more than the second coming is a secret, more or less, as of this moment. However, um, the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. Yet, we do have scripture that gives us hints. Jesus did back here. Um, when, do, 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 24. Okay. He told them, he gave them a hint about when he's coming back as far as the second coming. Okay. Um, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, that means there's got to be a temple there. We talked about that before. There's no temple now. And there hasn't been since 70 AD. So somebody's got to build a temple. That's the only reason why we get excited or should get excited about a temple. It's not sacrifices happening there and all the other stuff, but it's, it just means, ooh, Jesus has got to come soon because we finally have that temple and they don't last very long. They didn't in the Old Testament and this one here won't last very long. Temples do not last long. So that's just a, we get excited because that means Jesus is coming. All right, in the temple. Whoever reads, let him understand. Uh, and then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who's on the housetop not go down, grabbing his, any of his goodies or anything. You better take off, hit the road. Okay, so. Abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. Look, let's take a look at that. Because there's so much controversy over it. Um, I, I want people to be people to go here and um, be able to take a look themselves and not say, you know, you don't make any sense at all. Whatever. This is 70 weeks prophecy. So we saw, have Gabriel talking about 70 weeks. So he's get, laying out the future history of Israel. So, and he tells them how it's going to go down. I'm not getting into all the details of this because that is several hours worth of study you could spend on this right now. But I'll key in on this verse right here. Um, this will be war, desolations are determined, and all this kind of stuff. So it's going to be, you know, people are going to come to destroy the city and so forth. And some of that did happen in 70 AD, but then I think we sp spoke about gaps before. Jesus had gaps in his coming. Angel Gabriel came to Mary and said, hey, you're going to bring forth a son and all these good things are going to happen and it's going to sit on the king, on the throne of King David. There's a 2,000 year gap there. Jesus did the same thing when he read the Isaiah scroll. He read through the passage part way from uh, Isaiah and then he stopped at a comma, basically in the middle of a sentence and didn't finish the rest of that verse that's not supposed to happen for 2,000 years after at the second coming, which confused the people there. So there are gaps in, in prophecy very frequently. There's a near fulfillment that's partial and then full, complete fulfillment later. So so then we get to verse 27 and um, speaking of desolations are coming and then so desolations are, are determined and so forth. It sounds like events a thing, but then the language changes here. It says, and he, he, okay, he will confirm a covenant with the many for one week or we're talking about now a person. Okay, and he's a desolator. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. Now, the meaning of abominations, that's where you get abomination of desolation, will come the one who makes desolate. He will, will, will come the one who makes desolate. Sometimes people try to say that well, it was about Jesus. The one who stops the sacrifices is Jesus. Oh, is he an abomination that makes desolate? You want to call Jesus an abomination because this is the context here. He's going to stop the grain offerings and the sacrifices, and on the wing of abominations will come the one who makes desolate until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, gushes forth on the one who makes desolate. And we, we can confirm that this is about the man of sin in a couple other ways. First, let's take a look at this. So here he tells us in the middle of the week. This is the part I want you to grab for the moment. But in the middle of the week, and then he will make desolate and there'll be 
that he'll desecrate the temple. So you have a week, you have a seven day period here you're talking about. Well, what did we just read? Jesus said um, that there will be, they're going to deliver you to tribulation and so forth. But he also said in 14 and 15, um, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, so he's talking about the middle of the week. Whoever reads this, let him understand. We understand the middle of the week. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him in the fields. Okay, so then, um, so then there will come great tribulation. See what he says here. For then there will be great tribulation. And how bad is it? Is it 70 AD bad? Oh, it's worse. Because he says, then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world. So whatever this great tribulation is, there'll be nothing worse up to that time. No nor ever shall be. Okay, what about the two world wars, if it was 70 AD? You had two world wars. Oops. So is the Great Tribulation 70 AD? No, because you had two world wars that were far worse, far worse on every imaginable scale than 70 AD. So nope, we're still looking at the future, because we're, we're just a little bit north of the Second World War, um, and that was the worst one so far. Um, so this is going to be the worst time ever, is what he's saying. And that hasn't happened yet. And unless those days be shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the next sake, those days will be shortened. And please, is this is not about somehow the earth picks up speed and starts spinning faster or anything like that. What this is, those days being shortened, are going to be shortened because Jesus is going to go, all right, that's it. Everybody out of the pool, blow his whistle, step down from heaven and step on the earth and get into the middle of Armageddon, judge everybody, and stop things before we self-destruct, because we're on the way to not just his wrath and the Antichrist's wrath, which is really the beast of Satan that by this time. So we're on our way to just gone, nothing. Unless Jesus come, came back or comes back when he does, shortens those days, no flesh would be, no flesh would be saved. No flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, his call those days will be shortened, and he shortens them himself. He's not making the days, making the earth spin faster or something, okay? Stop it. Okay, so then, let's continue here. So, what I also wanted to look at about the middle of the week to confirm the desolations, and Jesus mentions it again here, for another passage that describes it, and I want to I hit all these main ones for you because that way you've got them, and I hope you're taking notes. Now let's, not at, sorry, shouldn't have held the shift key. Second, Thessalonians. That won't work. Thessalonians 2. All right. This man of lawlessness or man of sin, okay? What happens? Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, regarding the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. So that's the context about that. That you don't be quickly shaken from your composure or to be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if it came from us. And it's some, either some, a spirit like something demonic or whatever, something satanic going on, or a fake, another epistle, um, uh, to the effect that the day of the Lord is coming. In other words, you guys missed the boat. It came and it went. The day of the Lord, Joel, is the whole tribulation period. And, and, and the tribulation period starts off at one point and it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And we see this in the book of Revelation. You have the sealed judgments where the way you read the destruction that's happening upon the earth, it's one-fourth of the earth, one-fourth of the population, one-fourth of the earth, everything. Because it does mention the sword and death and destruction and animals attacking people and so forth. So it's not just the earth like global warming. We're talking about people too, which we've discussed with the numerical... Um, equivalent as of today would be about 2 billion people. That's never happened. That's unprecedented in history. No, it didn't happen in 70 AD. But at that time, it'll be the worst time ever in history. So then, fast forward to by the time you get to the trumpet judgments, in the trumpet judgments, you will have another 2 billion people killed. How does that work? Because now we've gone from one fourth to one third of the earth destroyed. The trumpet judgments. So it mentions one fourth seals, and then in the trumpets it mentions one-third. 
one third of the six remaining is another two billion. And then we haven't even got to the bold judgments yet. And I don't know if we if we can make clear in that text or make the argument that if the seals was one fourth of the earth destroyed and the trumpets is one third, well, it'll go from one fourth to one third. Does that mean make the bowls? Are they going to be one half the world, whatever's left then destroyed? Because we're already down to by the time we're done with the trumpets, half the world. So four billion people. So by the time we're done with um, the bowls, another couple billion. So there will be like two billion people left. Um, and that's just as a result of the judgments, not even counting collateral damage like normal um, deaths and um, wars, the things that are going on, uh, raping, terrorism, um, you know, all the all the stuff that's going to be happening. It's going to be horrific. So this could be the whole world would be destroyed. And then you got everybody gathering at Megiddo and you've got all this stuff happening. So it's going to be pretty bad. So no, that wasn't 70 AD. So what what uh, you see described in Revelation, uh, that's all symbolism, right? It's symbolism. All right. I don't know who decides it's symbolic and what the meaning is. I don't know if there's a Democratic vote on that or if people submit a ballot. Maybe that whoever's got the biggest degree gets to decide where the symbolism is and determine the meaning. Maybe that, that would be cool. And then maybe they make a survey and everybody gets to vote on it. Ooh, I like that meaning. So, it's nonsense. Because good luck taking Revelation and going back to the Old Testament and trying to find it in symbolism in the Old Testament. You can with some of the animals that represent countries. But then in the text in the Old Testament and particularly in the New Testament and, and from what we've seen from history, we know exactly what countries they were. You know, you're talking about a leopard and you're talking about a bear and all this kind of stuff. And so you can, you do find symbolism in there. But the meaning is is uh, just about every time spelled out for us. And tell, we're told what the meaning of the symbolism is. Unless you want to read in symbolism that was not, the author did not intend to be taken as symbolism. So anyway, once again, I digress. So, don't be quickly shaken from your composure, disturbed, whatever. Uh, no one is to deceive you in any way, for it will not come until the apostasy or the great falling away comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed. So um, the son of destruction. He opposes and exalts himself. So, we, you know, the context here is second coming. We're not going to see the second coming until we see this this period going on here. And the, the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and does what? He exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes the seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as God. Now, this is much as Antiochus Epiphanes did when he erected a statue of Zeus. He even had a statue of himself put in there. He had pigs slaughtered on the altar, so defiling the temple. So this is what Satan does, and he's going to do it again while possessing the Antichrist. That's why he's the beast. The man of sin will be possessed by Satan, and this is what he's going to do. And that's in the middle of the week, so we know mid-trip, this is what he does. He says, don't you remember that when I was still with you? I told you these things, and you know that what restrains him now, that he will be revealed in his time, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains, oh, the restrainer is a he, will do so until he is removed. Um, so the question is, who's the restrainer? What's the restrainer all of us? The restrainer is a he. And who can restrain evil all over the world at the same time? That would take omnipotence, right? And omnipresence. That's only the Holy Spirit. That's only God can do that. Um, and, and until he's removed, he will be removed off the earth, but taken out of the way from the, that particular ministry of restraining. Then the lawlessness, lawless one will be revealed. He'll show his true colors. That's in the middle of the tribulation. Well, that's when everybody repents and runs and flees. And Jesus says, flee to the mountains. Go. And he says that he's going to protect them there in Revelation for a certain number of days or a certain number of months. Okay. Um, so it'll be in accord with the activity of Satan. That's because he's going to be um, possessed by Satan by this time. With all power, false signs and wonders and deceptive wickedness and uh, things like this. So God will send over them a deluding influence so that they would believe what is false and lie with them. Um, all may be judged who did not believe the truth and took pleasure in, in wickedness. So we see here mid-trip. Uh, now, 
to see it, this played out, and we, here we if you go further and further into the New Testament, you see greater expansion and explanation of what's going on. Now, um, not to be outdone by Paul, John, in Revelation, will give us some of these events too. Let's just take a look at this. We go into um, Revelation 11, but I already did that in another um, video that you'll see here about the two witnesses and the timing of the two witnesses. And I handled some of the passages there about that, not all, but the two witnesses. Okay, so Revelation chapter 12. Um, great sign in heaven. Satan is there going after the woman who represents Israel, just like Joseph's dream. And um, then um, what happened is God finally tells Michael to go ahead and, and lip it in the bud, cast Satan down to the earth. Um, Satan now has access to the throne, which we know just from reading Job, and we're also told in Scripture that he's ever before the throne of grace, um, accusing the saints. So he's always accusing uh, the saints before before God. Uh, he's like a lion in the streets, seeking whom he may devour. He's the prince of the power of the earth, so he's got a lot of access. But this time he's got no more access into heaven, so he's a angry. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth. He persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. So he's going after Israel now. It's scorched earth policy at this time. He's angry. He's serious. But the two wings of the great eagle were, were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to take her place. This isn't an airplane or anything like this. I've heard that before. The same language is used referring to uh, going ahead of Egypt um, in uh, the Old Testament. Uh, like the wings of an eagle it has to do with speed and uh, your, your flight. Let your flight, you know, words rapidly. Same language is used in the Old Testament regarding the Jews leaving Egypt. Um, so, um, since so she could fly into the wilderness to her place, so she's got a place in the wilderness, and many people think Petra could be. Um, God's still going to have to divinely protect them because missiles could go there, right? But God, no weapon formed against thee will harm thee. That's the context of that passage. It's, it's to Israel. Sorry, Americans. There is some application to you. If God wants to protect you, he can, and he's sovereign, and he will, but that promise is directly and specifically to Israel. So they will not be able to harm Israel in that place and other Gentile believers, whoever might be there, the converts during the tribulation week. So um, so she's um, nourished for a time, times, and half a time. So three and a half years from the serpent, and the serpent hurled water like a river out of his mouth. Um, and the Lord can send a flood of army after her and, should, and, and be swept away at the flood. But the earth helped the woman and because the Lord, it's not that the earth is that altruistic. God is doing it, right? God's going to open up the earth to swallow that army that comes out of the serpent, Satan's mouth, as he sends a, an army after him. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children, other believers, who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. He's the scorched earth policy. Okay. Let's look at that time frame of a time, times and half a time. We get it confirmed here. Um, so the beast, he came out of the um, sea, the, the, um, out of the, the, the uh, sea very often is a large number of people. Um, uh, on his heads were blasphemous names and so forth. So we have this imagery we already know of the dragon uh, and um, so forth, seeing they worship the dragon. Um, this is just symbolic of, of this leader, and this is another study. And um, so there is symbolism in here, but it, then it tells us tells us uh, the meaning, and it tells us it's not a literal dragon because it's talking about a mouth that's given names, speaking arrogant words, blasphemies, and authority to act for um, 42 months given to him. Um, he opened his mouth, blasphemies against God, uh, his name and his tabernacle, that those who dwell, um, that is, those who dwell in heaven. It was given to him. Now, we know the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. The church is not here at this point. So it's given to him to make war with the saints, the tribulation saints, and to overcome them. So he's actually given permission to overcome them who convert um, to the Lord during this period. And, and authority is given to him over every tribe people, language, and nation, all who live on the earth and worship him, everyone whose name has uh, not been written since the foundation of the world, in other words, all unbelievers, 
and, and into the book of life. They'll be, all, they'll be slaughtered. If anyone has an ear, let them hear. Well, they won't all be slaughtered because Jesus is going to um, shorten those days, right? He's, it's going to be shortened. Um, so we've got the time times and half a time given in the form of 1260 days. So the point I wanted to bring out of this is we know from the middle of the week, there's three and a half years left, and we see this three and a half years left. Now, if you see this happening and you see this guy standing up in the temple and you see the two witnesses slain and all this, you know that you got three and a half years left. You can take your calendar out on your cell phone and you can go, oh, today is okay, so three and a half years. That's when Jesus is coming back. Um, so no man knows the day or the hour now. But by the time you get into these events in the middle of the tribulation, you're going to be able to calendar it. And you are not going to be caught off guard like a thief. No one's going to be really caught off guard like a thief then. They're caught off guard at the beginning, which brings us back to Noah and being caught off guard like a thief. Um, so go. let's go back to Matthew 24. Take a look at that again. Um I really had a lot of things. I'm just trying to make some points here. And I'm trying to, you know, you you put a three by five card on the crime board and then you take some yarn and you attach it to some other scriptures and you, okay. You just want to do that kind of a thing. Okay, so we're trying to use forensics on the scripture here. Um, so, of that day and hour, no one knows, though, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. So is that second coming? Well, by the time that happens, we're going to know. But Jesus in the context here is talking about, um, in the context here, is there's a lot of, see, second coming. Son of man will appear in heaven. All the tribes of earth will mourn. They will see the son of man coming. That doesn't describe rapture. That's second coming. Son of man coming on the clouds with great power and glory. The context is second coming. And then he says, um, but, and then we have here a pivot, but, of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Well, as of now, no one knows, but what happened in between um, was look at the, the way it flows here. Look at verse 37. Look at how it's reading here. So I'm just saying that there's some subtext. I don't want to say, speak out of turn and say more than I need to say, but what is the context here? Is, is this a big ball? Um, but as the days of Noah were, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. So he's talking about judgment. He's talking about the days of Noah. He's talking about the tribulation, right? Leading up to the flood, people were living life as usual. Now, by the time you get into the tribulation, you have people, billions of people dying. Are they going to be living life as usual? No, because the flood waters are coming. They're not drowning yet. They haven't water's up to here and it's going up to their nose but they're in it they're in the judgment the day of the lord as joel calls it. this whole seven year period is the day of the lord culminating ultimately in the second coming when he puts the kibosh on everything and pronounces judgment you've got the sheep and goats judgment um so what he's talking about is so shall the coming of the son of man be and then he's talking about before the flood, before the judgment. So he's talking about pre-tribulation. We're at the head of it here. Well, it's pre because the water's not falling yet, right? It's not raining yet. You see the clouds gathering. This is a call to the attention. Whoop, what happened to Noah there? Wait a minute. The door's shut. Uh-oh. You know, they can be out barbecuing, doing whatever, and they got wedding plans, and they're going, hmm. And Noah was locked into the ark for a while, and they go, Anybody hear anything? Or is... No, not yet. Okay, well, anyway, you know, how about those bears? And they're flipping burgers on the grill, okay? Life as usual with Noah until the rain started falling because Noah was in there for a spell before the rains came. So, as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man, for as in the days before the flood, as in that, 
They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and didn't know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the, will the coming of the Son of Man be. So if the context is the second coming, that's fine, but so also would be the coming of the Son of Man. You've got to have the flood before you have um, Noah coming out of the ark, the deliverance. So the coming of the Son of Man, you've got to have the flood beforehand. So the judgment and then the second coming. It's going to be just like that, just like it was with Noah. Judgment, then the delivery. Judgment, and then the delivery. So does this mean post-tribulational rapture? Well, we're going to get into some of that. What does it say here in the context? Let's keep reading because we see two different things here. For one, well, I'll get into that. I'm going to get ahead of myself here. But um, then, so at this time, uh, Noah's flood, okay, we got that day and the hour. It's going to kick off. Um, Noah's flood. But it's going to be like Noah's flood. Um, two men are going to be in a field. Um, and this will give us the context here, okay? So stick with me here. Two men will be in a field. One will be taken. The other one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken. And the other one's left. Watch therefore, for you don't know what hour your Lord is coming. Again, that can't be second coming if all this stuff's going on. Especially if it's the days of Noah and you know it's a seven-year tribulation. So I maintain that this, I didn't always believe this way, but I maintain that this is the rapture. Know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, yeah, seven years from now. Let me set my calendar. I'm going to be here with a baseball bat. No, this is, this is talking beforehand. This is before the second coming. He would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. He wouldn't be caught off guard like a thief. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you don't expect. So this is a different event. Now, some people will try to say, well, one taken and one left, the ones that taken are the ones taken in judgment. So they're taken away in judgment. Okay, so, um, so the... The ones left behind are going to go through the flood. They're taken in judgment. So, where are they taken? Now, this is different from what we saw before. And I had this chart, and I'll put this up here. In this chart, you see two different things going on. You see two different events. This one... It talks about in the context, as in the days of Noah, and then before the flood, how they're living. Before the flood, what? And then you got one taken, one left, and so forth. So one's taken and one's left at some point in here. And then you've got Matthew 25. And we can go there again. Why not? Um, just as it shows in, in the chart. Um, you want to try to say that this is at the end of the tribulation where one's taken and one's left. Um, at what point in the tribulation or anywhere in there would the people be taken in judgment and then the believers left behind? And then what's done with them? You got a different scenario here Look at Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, in his glory, bright, shiny, not very thief-like, thief -like with all the fireworks and stuff going on. We see that in Revelation 19. All the holy angels with him. Then he'll sit on his throne of glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. So this is really after Revelation 19. So he's done, settled everything. All the nations are gathered before him. Everybody's gathered. Um, now, just the ones that are taken, that we just looked at in Matthew 24, the elect, or the unbelievers, is it just one party or the other that's gathered? Because if you want to say one party or the other is gathered, 
This one says here, all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. So here, everybody's gathered. This is two different events. In Matthew 24, one's taken and one's left. Two people are working in the field. One's taken, one's left. And this is all over the world because while two people are in a field and two women are, are working at a mill, one's taken and one's left. You've got a couple people who are still in bed. One's taken and one's left. And he will set his sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then the left go into outer darkness, the goats, sheep and the goats judgment. This is after he's the second coming. Now, the problem, too, is that if you want to try to say that Matthew 24 is at the end of the tribulation, then here's a logic problem. And uh, please be patient. I apologize to those who've heard this before and understand this, but I have to make this point. If you have the kingdom right after, well, here, Jesus is sitting on his throne here, right here, does the sheep and goats thing, He's on a throne of glory. Get ready to kick off kingdom on earth here because he gathers the nations right here and he's on his throne in glory right here on earth in Jerusalem. Starting off kingdom. So if everybody's been raptured right before this because everybody's been gathered, all the believers then are gathered and taken up and it's after the end of the tribulation. And we all go to be with the Lord. We all have our glorified bodies. Okay? And, you know, it's... Will we all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye? First uh, Corinthians fifteen fifty and following. Well, where are the mortals? Mortal believers. No unbelievers are going to be going, and no goats are going into the kingdom. And of the kingdom, we're told that you know there'll be a child being able to play in a viper pit, viper pit, and not get bitten. Um, we read about old your old man. You'll still, still be considered a child when you're a hundred years old. You've got the Lord having to rule with a rod of iron because there's disobedience. Um, you've got nations who are going to have the rain removed from them because Feast of Tabernacles comes during the year and they didn't take the road and go up to Jerusalem. So the Lord's going to stop the rain. So you've got sinners on earth during the kingdom. Also, so you've got making babies and so forth and the population growing so that by the time you get to the end of the millennium, after the, after the thousand years, Satan is released. He's in chains for the thousand years. After that, he's released for a short season. And kind of like Gog and Magog, they're going to go after Jerusalem. Because who is in Jerusalem? Jesus is on his throne in Jerusalem. And then he's going to be able to recruit a bunch of people. And like Gog and Magog, they're going to go after Jesus and be put down on a word. So that's why it's different from the Ezekiel 38 version. That's how you know they're different. Because you have Gog killed on the mountains outside and all this stuff. It's a big war, and Israel's being attacked, and your women are being pillaged. None of those, not going to be time for any pillaging. Jesus is going to put them down at a word um, in this Gog Magog type war where they're going after. It's like Gog Magog because they're going after Jerusalem again. Where does Satan recruit? All You have only believers by the time you go into the kingdom, no one around to make babies because we're supposed to be as in the angels, neither marrying nor given in marriage by the time we have our glorified bodies and we're in the kingdom. See, that's, that's a problem with the whole post-tribulation rapture or whatever because you got a glorification and then you got to deal with where do you get the mortals? Because you got to have sinners during the kingdom too. People who sin and so forth. Um, you know, their children, their offspring, they're not going to get by with what they do today, um, of course. But, um, uh, you thought things were strict in a small town. The kingdom is going to be Jesus ruling with a rod of iron. Um, so this is that passage. So went through some of that. We can also spend some time going into the whole thing about wrath, and maybe we'll we'll do that here before too long. But um, we need because we need to. And the whole thing about um, no man knowing, as opposed to setting off fireworks like Jesus' second coming is, that's not very thief-like. Thief -like. So we need to get into wrath and we need to get into the thieves. Wrath, thieves. And, and take a look at that. But pray about this passage. Go into it. Re-listen. Go out there and listen to other recordings and preachers. Um, and just make sure you dig into the Word and, and check what the Scripture says. Pray about it. 
Um, see if I'm I'm wrong. But you know, please don't send me forty, fifty, a hundred letters telling me how wrong I am and how I need to repent and how I have it all wrong. Um, I'm not asking you to do that because I get all those anyway. Um, I've been studying a bit at this for a little while. You know, I've, I've been doing this for. I, I keep changing in little ways, little things, like little nuances I see and I discover. Oh, that's an interesting little bit of an angle or tidbit. But I've been at this now for over 50 years. And I, I was unsettled at the first and through studying over time and digging into the scriptures like this, I'm pretty settled now. I don't, I'm not going to shift off of being pre-tribulation or pre-millennial. Um, this isn't the only passage or reason why, but I'm just saying this, kind of this is the way I have to look at this. And I didn't always see rapture between the lines or in the subtext here of of this passage. Um, and I can get into more of more stuff in here. I see that I was not able to get into, but um, um, yeah, I'm pre-tribulation or pre-millennial and I'm staying there and I'm going to continue watching because for one thing, um, you know, the Lord said to watch. So I'm going to watch. I'm excited about watching. I'm um, anxious about seeing the Lord. I'm anxious to hear although believers are probably the only ones to hear it. I'm anxious to hear that, that big shofar from heaven, whatever that's going to be like. I don't know what the kind of, how that trumpet's going to sound or whatever. Um, so it might be at an hour I don't expect. And that also is, is wedding language. Um, and I'm ready. So watching like this promotes holiness because you don't want your master to find you to arrive and you're being un, un, uh, unfaithful. Um, that'll be, that would be embarrassing at the very least, right? Um, caught not being faithful. So anyway, that's the end of this. We'll, we'll try to pick this up. I'll try to pick up. I'll probably have some strays in between that I missed. We'll try to pick up some of those, um, next time and pick up uh, verse 45. And I'm probably going to have to edit the Dickens out of this because I'm, I'm sure I went, I went long, but you have to agree. It's an important passage, right? An important passage. All right, well, I hope it blesses you out that you reread and you study and uh, that you're blessed always in the reading of the Scripture. Thank you.